At 5.45am on the 25th of October 1944, a TBM Avenger, piloted by Ensign Bill Brooks, launches off the flight deck of the escort carrier USS St. Lowe. Brooks is conducting an anti-submarine patrol off the island of Samar in the Philippines. The St. Lowe is one of the six small escort carriers, three Fletcher-class destroyers, and four destroyer escorts which compose Task Unit Taffy 3, which is just to the east of Samar. The 13 ships of Taffy 3 are a subunit of Vice Admiral Thomas Kincaid's US 7th Fleet, providing close support to General Douglas MacArthur's land forces as they stormed the island of Leyte. Three more Avengers and two older Wildcat fighters fan out to the northwest to search for Japanese activity. However, a thick cloud cover prevents Brooks from observing the water's surface until just after 6.30am, when he finally spots a break in the layer. He dives through the opening to 4,000 feet to discover a surprising sight. Below him are the darkened shapes of large warships steaming southeast towards Taffy 3's position. Believing this must be Admiral Bull Halsey's US 3rd Fleet, he remarks to his turret gunner, Hey, look at that. Halsey must have come down from the north. His gunner responds, Thank God they're on our side. Yet, the more Brooks studies the formation of ships, the more suspicious he becomes. There are no aircraft carriers among the 23 vessels in this fleet. If these are Halsey's ships, then where are the large fleet carriers? And despite his extensive training in ship identification, none of these vessels resemble any American or British warship type. Only when Brooks flies a little closer does he realise the horrible truth. This is a powerful Japanese surface force. But first, a quick word from our sponsor World of Warships, a free-to-play online multiplayer PC game where you can command the hardest-hitting World Wars 1 and 2 warships, including Musashi and Yamato. Using a variety of ship classes from battleships to submarines, recruit legendary commanders, upgrade your vessels and stake your claim to naval supremacy with or against an active community of players around the world in varied, thrilling and immersive battles with a constant flow of new in-game content every month. It's also available on consoles. The visuals are stunning, with over 40 maps to play and dynamic weather effects that affect the battle. There are over 500 vessels to choose from. It's the perfect game to relax and take your mind off things. Download World of Warships for free using the link in the description. During registration, use the code WARSHIPS to get exclusive rewards including a bunch of doubloons, credits, premium account time and a free ship after you complete 15 battles. Jump in for naval combat on the oceans today. As if to punctuate this realisation, anti-aircraft flak explodes around Brooks's Avenger, forcing him to take evasive action while he gets on the radio to warn Taffy 3. The small, undergunned and outnumbered task unit is about to be attacked by an enemy with overwhelming strength. The coming engagement will be one of the most desperate fights in the history of the US Navy. This confrontation is just one element of what some consider to be the largest naval battle in history, the Battle of the Leyte Gulf. Five days earlier, MacArthur's Allied ground troops landed on the island of Leyte in the first phase of the American and Australian reconquest of the Philippines. To stop the Philippines from falling, the Imperial Japanese Navy sails out with the last of its strength. Split into three prongs, north, centre and south, the objective is for the centre and southern forces to penetrate the Leyte Gulf and destroy the Allied beachhead. In order to accomplish this, the northern force will act as a decoy to draw the US Navy away from Leyte, allowing the powerful surface forces in the other two formations to attack the landing beaches. Defending the invasion forces are the US 3rd and 7th Fleets. 3rd Fleet is under the command of Admiral Halsey and contains the bulk of the US Navy's best and largest warships, including Task Force 38, the most powerful aircraft carrier formation in the world. Vice Admiral Kincaid's 7th Fleet is less impressive, with mostly old battleships, a mixture of obsolete cruisers and destroyers, along with support ships, including escort carriers. On the 24th of October, 3rd Fleet's aircraft ravaged Rear Admiral Takeo Kurita's center force and sank the super battleship Musashi in the Battle of the Savoyan Sea. These losses forced Kurita to retreat with the rest of his warships. 7th Fleet has also demonstrated that it can still pack a punch. The Japanese southern force was annihilated by Kincaid's battleships during the one-sided Battle of the Surigao Strait on the morning of the 25th of October. 
With these two victories, it currently appears that the Japanese naval offensive has been halted. Little do the Americans know, they are on the brink of disaster. With centre force apparently defeated, Admiral Halsey orders 3rd Fleet North to attack a large carrier formation sailing from southern Japan, while Admiral Kincaid's battleships guard the Surigao Strait. What Halsey doesn't know is he is falling right into the Japanese trap. Vice Admiral Jisaburo Azawa's decoy force has been stripped of most of its air wings. Furthermore, Admiral Kurita's center force was spotted by American scout aircraft retreating away westwards, but, unbeknownst to the Americans, has since turned around and is heading back towards the San Bernardino Strait, the northern entrance to the Leyte Gulf. Because Halsey has taken all of 3rd Fleet north, the strait is left wide open and center force enters the Leyte Gulf at 3am without being detected. The reasons for this mistake are miscommunication and poor command structure. Halsey and 3rd Fleet are subordinated to Admiral Chester Nimitz, who is monitoring the operation from Pearl Harbor. This is in contrast to Kincaid's 7th Fleet, which is under the direct command of General MacArthur due to its role supporting the invasion. As a result, neither fleet makes it a priority to communicate with each other. When Halsey announces he will head north to attack Azawa's carriers, he does not directly inform Kincaid, who only finds out from listening in on US naval communications to Admiral Nimitz. To make matters worse, Halsey has also promised to guard the San Bernardino Strait with his own Task Force 34, a formation of fast battleships, cruisers and destroyers. However, quite simply, he doesn't. He takes Task Force 34 north with 3rd Fleet, rather than blocking the strait, and Kincaid is not notified. This perfect storm of compounding errors is about to lead to catastrophe, as the powerful surface fleet of Centre Force bears down on Taffy 3, the hopelessly outgunned unit defending the entire Leyte landings. Taffy 3, comprising six small escort carriers, three destroyers and four destroyer escorts, must hold the line against four battleships, six heavy cruisers, two light cruisers and eleven destroyers. All these powerful surface vessels will have free reign to annihilate the American and Australian forces fighting on Leyte and all of their support vessels. As anti-aircraft fire shakes his aircraft, Ensign Bill Brooks sends an urgent warning on St. Lowe's main radio frequency. Derby Base, enemy surface force of four battleships, four heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, and 10 to 12 destroyers, sighted 20 miles northwest of your task group and closing in on you at 30 knots. The report is overheard by Taffy 3's commander, Rear Admiral Clifton Ziggy Sprague, aboard his flagship, the escort carrier USS Fanshawe Bay. Annoyed, Sprague assumes that an inexperienced aviator has misidentified an American surface force and calls down to Fanshawe Bay's Combat Information Center. Airplot, tell him to check his identification. Angered that his report is being doubted, Brooks drops to just 2,000 feet above the Japanese warships and overflies Admiral Kurita's flagship, the super battleship Yamato. Brooks navigates the storm of flak while his radio man snaps pictures of the enemy formation. He checks and rechecks the coordinates before calling Fanshawe Bay on the radio. I see the pagoda masts, and I see the biggest red meatball flag I ever saw flying on the biggest battleship I ever saw. At the same time, Radio men aboard the ships of Taffy 3 begin picking up Japanese radio transmissions. The distant black puffs of flak bracketing Brooks' Avenger are now becoming visible to the American crews on deck. There is no doubt now. From Yamato's gunnery platform, Commander Tonosuke Otani is scanning the horizon and spots enemy aircraft carriers in the distance. He misidentifies the ships of Taffy 3 as six Essex-class fleet carriers escorted by one or two battleships, along with ten or more heavy cruisers. Rear Admiral Kurita can hardly believe his luck. The Japanese force has apparently stumbled upon the pride of the US Navy, its fast carrier force. Below decks, gun crews work feverishly to load massive 18.1-inch armour-piercing shells into Yamato's main battery guns. The rest of the Japanese warships also prepare to engage, unaware that they massively outgun their smaller, slower enemy. The mood on the bridge of the Fanshawe Bay is initially one of disbelief. Rear Admiral Sprague knows that his warships stand little chance against the Japanese force. 
Yamato herself displaces nearly 70,000 tons, almost as much as the combined weight of every ship in Taffy 3. This task unit is only intended to escort cargo convoys to the beachhead, carry out long-range recon patrols, and provide close air support for the fighting men on the ground. The six escort carriers combined carry a sizeable contingent of over 150 aircraft, but they are almost entirely outfitted with anti-personnel and anti-submarine weaponry. Their high explosive bombs and depth charges will do little against the enemy behemoths cresting the horizon. Despite the odds stacked against Taffy 3, Sprague concludes his only option is to fight. At 6.50am, he orders every escort carrier to turn east into a strong wind. This heading will take them directly away from the enemy fleet, towards a rain squall, where he might be able to find concealment. While his carriers are turning full into the wind, Taffy 3 goes to general quarters, and Sprague radios his carriers. Launch all planes as soon as possible. Although his aircraft won't be able to dent the enemy battleships and cruisers, Admiral Sprague hopes they will distract and confuse the Japanese force. The destroyers and destroyer escorts are ordered to lay a smokescreen and zigzag to shield the escort carriers from view. It takes just five minutes for the carriers to swing into the wind, while every pilot in Taffy 3 sprints to their aircraft. The ordnance personnel equip Avengers and Wildcats with anything they can get their hands on, including rockets, high-explosive bombs, depth charges, and ammunition for their machine guns. In many cases, American aircraft are sent to attack the Japanese warships with nothing at all. At 6.59am, Yamato opens fire with her main battery at a range of 20 miles, followed soon after by the battleships Nagato, Haruna, and Congo. Splashes erupt near the escort carrier USS White Plains. The Battle of Samar has begun. At the rear of the American formation is the destroyer USS Johnston. Johnston's skipper is Commander Ernest E. Evans, who quickly sizes up the situation and, without waiting for orders, decides to attack. At 7am, he addresses the crew from the bridge. All hands to general quarters, prepare to attack major portion of the Japanese fleet, all engines ahead flank, commence making smoke and stand by for a torpedo attack, left full rudder. At Johnston's commissioning ceremony, Evans told his crew, This is going to be a fighting ship. I intend to go in harm's way, and anyone who doesn't want to come along had better get off right now. Now, he is leading them in a lone charge against the powerful Japanese surface force. Johnston peels off from the rest of Taffy 3 and charges right at the enemy fleet through a gauntlet of colourful shell splashes, the coloured dye meant to help the Japanese gunners aboard the battleships track their salvos. The small destroyer cuts through the waves and chases the splashes, hoping that the enemy won't fire at the same place twice. Aboard Yamato, Admiral Kurita orders a general attack against the American warships, at the same time Johnston begins her attack. This gives his individual captains the freedom to pursue the enemy how they see fit, but the order quickly leads to confusion, as the Japanese fleet breaks up into several different columns. Despite its vast superiority over Taffy 3, Centre Force is slow to begin a proper attack on the Americans. By the time the formation is sorted out, the Japanese heavy cruisers are leading the charge while the two divisions of 13 destroyers attempt to flank Taffy 3 from the east. Yet, as the destroyers begin to rapidly close the distance to the American carriers, Kurita orders them to the rear of the formation, afraid they will burn too much fuel chasing the enemy. It is a decision that will have massive consequences for the rest of the battle. At 7.04am, Yamato straddles white planes with a salvo. Although there are no direct hits, the shocks from the near misses from the 18.1-inch shells are enough to knock out steering, radar and electrical power. Swift damage control is able to bring all of these systems back online within just three minutes. At the same time, the escort carrier USS Kalinin Bay is also targeted by the Japanese battleships. Lieutenant Earl Archer is third in line to launch, while the splashes of near misses drench the open cockpit of his Avenger. Archer is not a religious man, but he prays for the first time in his life. Lord, please don't let me die sitting here on deck. Finally, when it's his turn to launch, 
he is able to take off as one of the few pilots with a full weapons loadout of bombs, rockets and machine guns. At 7.10am, White Plains takes a direct hit from an 8-inch shell fired from a heavy cruiser. Luckily, the rounds pass right through the carrier like a bullet through paper. The armour-piercing shells fired by the Japanese warships are ill-suited for killing the lightly armoured escort carriers. Furthermore, this hit, along with the damage caused by Yamato, have thrown up black smoke from the funnel, which leads the Japanese gunners to believe the carrier has blown up. Center Force shifts its fire away from White Plains, which escapes any further damage. Meanwhile, Johnston continues her lone charge against the Japanese formation. Somehow, she has not been hit despite a torrent of shells impacting the water around her. At 7.10am, the destroyer finally closes to within 18,000 yards of the closest warship, the heavy cruiser Kumano, which is the flagship of the Japanese cruiser division. Commander Evans gives the order to fire, and Lieutenant Hagen opens up with Johnston's four 5-inch guns. Aided by the excellent Mark 37 fire control computer, Johnston quickly scores several hits on Kumano, while continuing to sprint into torpedo range. Johnston's shells aren't large enough to sink the heavy cruiser, but her accurate fire devastates Kumano's thinly armoured superstructure. The destroyer is firing almost 80 shells a minute, and lands more than 40 hits on Kumano, while the Japanese heavy cruiser fails to score a single hit in return. Miraculously, Johnston is able to close to 10,000 yards and launches a spread of 10 torpedoes at Kumano at 7.18am. Commander Evans swings the destroyer hard to port and orders his vessel to head back to the main formation. While Johnston's torpedoes track towards Kumano, Taffy 3's aircraft begin their own desperate assault on the Japanese fleet. The pilots watch in awe as the lone destroyer continues to dodge and weave while it makes its way back towards the escort carriers. Approaching the column of enemy heavy cruisers, the pilots dive their aircraft in. Those carrying weapon loadouts drop whatever they have on the enemy vessels, a mixture of bombs, rockets and depth charges. Aircraft without any weapons carry out dummy attacks to draw fire and force the Japanese vessels into evasive action throwing off the aim of their main gun batteries. After pilots exhaust their ammunition, they join in the dummy attack runs which are surprisingly having an impact. Every time the cruisers are forced to turn away from imaginary torpedoes or bombs, the range opens up between the Japanese and Taffy 3. When the aircraft are low on fuel, they break off and head for the Takloban airfield on Leyte to refuel and rearm given that there is no guarantee their carriers will still be afloat when the pilots have finished their attacks. Although the American fleet is improbably engaging the enemy fleet with some success, Admiral Sprague knows this will not last. At 7.16am, he orders Commander William Thomas aboard the destroyer USS Hole to turn around and lead a torpedo attack with the USS Hearman. On the bridge of the small destroyer escort USS Samuel B. Roberts, Lieutenant Commander Bob Copeland asks Commander Thomas over the radio, Do you want the little little fellows to go with the big little fellows? Thomas replies immediately, Your last transmission, negative. Despite being denied, Copeland looks around and sees that his small vessel is best positioned to peel off and join the attack on the incoming Japanese cruisers. Without any other orders specifying what he is supposed to do, Copeland gets on the intercom and addresses the crew, this will be a fight against overwhelming odds from which survival cannot be expected. We will do what damage we can. With that, he orders Samuel B. Roberts to turn and follow the attacking destroyers, nearly colliding with the Hearman in the process. Copeland calls down to the engine room. This is the captain. We are going on a torpedo attack and I have rung up full speed. I want you to hook on everything you've got. Lieutenant Bill Trowbridge orders the boiler tenders to turn off the boiler safety valves. Although she ordinarily sails at a top speed of 24 knots, Samuel B. Roberts achieves nearly 29 knots as she makes her way towards the enemy cruiser column. While Hull, Hearman and Samuel B. Roberts close to make their attack, Johnston is still running away from the Japanese fleet, firing her 5-inch guns as she sails south. At 7.24am, one of Johnston's torpedoes strikes Kumano, blowing off her bow. 
the flagship of the Japanese cruiser division falls out of formation. Although this is a survivable hit, she is done for the day. Hull, Hearman and the Samuel B. Roberts are preparing their torpedo run. Hull is leading the loose formation while her captain, Commander Leon Kintberger, is also chasing salvos in an attempt to dodge enemy fire. Communications officer Lieutenant John Dix can't help but be impressed by his skipper's calm demeanour as he relays orders amid the intense fusillade. Right full rudder, steady up, now left full rudder, give it all you've got. The zigzagging column rapidly closes the distance to the Japanese fleet. At 7.25am, Hole's luck runs out when she is struck by a 6-inch shell from Yamato's secondary battery. The armour-piercing projectile scores a direct hit on the bridge, killing four and wounding Captain Kintberger. The fire control radar is also knocked out, meaning Hull's gunners are now firing by sight. Despite the damage, she is still in the fight, although Admiral Karita believes he has just sunk an enemy cruiser. Captain Kintberger leads Hull and the other two attackers into a rain squall where they are temporarily out of sight from the Japanese warships. Meanwhile, USS Johnston's crew has no time to celebrate their improbable victory against Kumano. Just a minute after Hull is hit, an accurate salvo from Yamato screams in on the destroyer. She takes three direct hits from the massive 18.1 inch shells which wreck the propeller gears, main steam turbine and a boiler. Three more 6 inch shells then impact the bridge, killing and wounding many in the pilot house. Commander Evans is peppered by shrapnel and loses two fingers off his left hand but stubbornly refuses medical attention. Despite the devastation on deck, Johnston is still floating thanks in part to a lack of fuel on board which prevents any serious fires. However, her superstructure is wrecked and her speed has been cut in half to about 17 knots. She limps into a rain squall while the crew performs damage control. As the wounded Johnston is fleeing into the squall, she runs across the three small American warships making their way towards the enemy column. The Hull, Hearman and Samuel B. Roberts pass by Johnston which is only operating on one engine. Despite Johnston's extensive damage, Evans watches the American column pass and decides that his ship is not done yet. He tells the officers on the bridge, we'll go in with the destroyers and provide fire support. His stunned officers cannot possibly believe they can survive yet another run at the Japanese fleet, but they swing Johnston around to once again make an attack. Gunnery officer Hagen later recalls saying to himself, Oh dear lord, I'm in for a swim. Using her surface search radar, Hall continues to close the range while firing her 5-inch guns at the lead Japanese battleship, Congo. Kintberger leads his vessel within 10,000 yards as the small destroyer duels with the 37,000 ton battleship. At 7.27am, her torpedo tubes swing out to starboard and fire five torpedoes at the Japanese cruiser column. However, at this close range, the Japanese gunners are finding it easier to train on their target. Hull takes several direct hits, the most serious of which knocks out steering. The helmsman reports that the rudder no longer answers as the destroyer begins an irreversible turn to port. Knowing that his ship is dying, Kintberger orders the crew to prepare to fire the rest of the torpedoes while they still can. The wounded hull is battered by enemy shell fire as she circles uncontrollably, with Captain Kintberger hoping he can line up a shot before it is too late. To her rear, the Hearman, Samuel V. Roberts and Johnston continue their attack run. Although she is sailing at only 17 knots and has no more torpedoes, Commander Evans spots the Japanese heavy cruiser Tone and gives the order to open fire with the 5 inch guns. At 7.37am, Johnston scores several hits on Tone, despite having no surface radar. The battle is now quickly descending into confusion, resembling a barroom brawl more than a naval engagement. In the skies above, American aviators continue to attack the Japanese warships regardless of whether their weaponry is effective or not. A pilot from the USS Fanshawe Bay, Lt. Thomas Lupo, makes several attack runs in his Avenger until he exhausted of all munitions. With nothing left to fire at the enemy and his aircraft low on fuel, Lupo makes another pass and hurls whatever he has laying around in his cockpit at the Japanese warships, including a clipboard and an empty coke bottle. 
now with quite literally nothing left to throw at the enemy. Lupo turns towards Taclopan Air Base in Leyte to rearm and refuel. Lieutenant Earl Archer of the USS Kalanin Bay's VC-3 has also run out of ammunition, but nevertheless goes in for a dummy torpedo run with two other Avengers. They target a battleship, probably either Haruna or Congo. The aircraft next to him is blown apart in mid-air, and the explosion gives Archer a concussion. Rather than aborting the run, he pulls out his 38 calibre revolver and fires at the battleship's bridge as he pulls up over the superstructure. He can see the dumbfounded faces of the Japanese officers as he flies past taking pot shots. These same officers are finding it difficult to concentrate on their own assault on Taffy 3 with the constant stream of American aircraft buzzing their ships. Karita's operations officer, Commander Tonosuke Otani, would later write, The attack was almost incessant, the bombers and torpedo planes were very aggressive and skillful, and the coordination was impressive. Aircraft from nearby task groups Taffy 1 and Taffy 2 have been alerted to the battle and are now beginning to arrive as well. Furthermore, the drifting smoke and scattered rain is reducing visibility across the battlefield, which reduces the effectiveness of the relatively primitive Japanese targeting equipment. The heavy cruiser division has nonetheless closed the distance to Taffy 3's escort carriers to just 8 miles, enough for a gunnery duel to break out between the cruisers and the USS St. Lo, which fires back with its single aft 5-inch gun. Aboard Fanshawe Bay, Admiral Sprague has a crucial decision to make. His current course is keeping his escort carriers mostly within the rain squall, but the run to the east is also taking them further away from the American warships currently in the Surigao Strait. Consequently, he orders a turn to starboard, and his carriers now flee towards the south. This is a risky gamble. If the Japanese react quickly enough, they can cut off and flank Taffy 3. But Sprague knows he must get help soon or his ships will be finished. By 7.40am, the American carriers are now heading south, while the escort force continues their desperate battle against the Japanese. Download World of Warships for free using the link in the description. During registration, use the code WARSHIPS to get exclusive rewards including a bunch of doubloons, credits, premium account time and a free ship after you complete 15 battles. Thanks again to our amazing patrons who help to keep these videos possible. Welcome to all our new patrons who have recently joined, and a special thanks to our patron of the week, Floyd Rocker, who has been a long time supporter. Patrons get early access to our videos ad and sponsor free, and we choose our favourite reactions each week to shout out. Our favourite patron comments of this week's video are from Jasper Poklakar, who says, I was hoping you would mention the Coca Cola bottle, you didn't disappoint. And Escape Evade, who says, I think no movie has ever been made about this battle because everyone would think this was a Hollywood fiction. On our Patreon, you'll be able to hear what we're up to behind the scenes, have the chance to influence the subjects of our videos, and you'll be able to send us questions for our new Q&A video series on our second channel, The Intel Report. If you'd like to check out our Patreon page, follow the link in the description below.